you very much for inviting me to, to talk today about uh, some of the work that I'm involved in. Uh, and the first thing I'd like to do is introduce you to Victoria. Uh, Victoria Albanier. Uh, Victoria Albanier makes the finest plantain and curries um, known to man. Everybody that she knows loves her food. All of her family come from miles around um, to eat her food. She's from Nigeria. Most of her family is from the same village that she's from. Uh, and she's always had a dream, a dream to kind of move beyond just cooking for her family and start cooking for other people. She'd love to start her own plantain parlour, and one day she thinks that she will, but she doesn't have any money. She has no assets, she's currently unemployed. Uh, most of her family have some money, but they don't have a lot. Um, she can borrow some money from a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend, um, who will come round to our house, but she knows it will be expensive. She's also quite worried. Um, and a friend of hers told her about a local organisation that was offering access to small loans to help start businesses for people like her. Uh, and that's where we met. Uh, not in Nigeria, where she's from and where her family's from, but in Dalston, in Hackney, about a mile and a half from here. <coughs> um, my journey to meet Victoria probably started about 15 years ago, when um, my family, who are from Bangladesh, took me to see uh, a, a lecture, a talk, by a guy who said that he was doing something in Bangladesh that other people weren't doing. He was making loans to people that the banks weren't making loans to. Because he found it stupid that, you know, if you're a banker, why make loans to people who already have money? Why not make it to people who don't? Um, and he used that as a basis for creating a new type of institution. Something that he said would empower women, create businesses, and move people out of poverty. Anyway, I thought he was bonkers. So I wrote him a letter and I said, I'd love to come and find out some more. Uh, do you think I can come to Bangladesh and spend a bit of time with you? And bizarrely, he responded. Um, and so I went to Bangladesh and I worked at the Grameen Bank and the World Bank and this guy Mohammed Yunus, um, really the kind of godfather, you could say, of microfinance around the world. And I spent um, a good couple of years trying to really understand what was successful microfinance. And microfinance is simply just the, the lending of money to people who don't have any with no assets. So no security. Normally loans are based, are based on you putting something down and somebody lending against it. Um, most of these loans were to women. And what really interested me about this was that actually, um, they basically said that even if you had nothing, you were still potentially creditworthy. Even if you had nothing financial, your aspiration and your creativity and your character were more about why you would pay that loan back than necessarily how much money you had in your bank account. And I found this, I found this amazing. And um, the longer I spent in the villages of Bangladesh looking at this and spending time working on these pro pro projects, the more I, the more I realised how similar so much of our decisions about finance and money and how we decide whether somebody's credit worthy or not um, were the same in England as they are in Bangladesh. And that might sound strange to you, because in some ways when you think about the United Kingdom, you don't really think about exclusion. You think, you think about the credit binge. You think about people who can't manage their finances. You think about over indebtedness. Um, and for many, this is absolutely true. But there is also another world. There's also another world that exists in the United Kingdom that many people don't really know about. This is a world where the words credit crunch have been a reality for large numbers of people in this country for many years, in fact for most of their lives. This is a, this is a world where if you want to buy a washing machine, a cooker, a fridge, if you want to start a small business, put a deposit down on a, on a flat, actually you're going to have to go to what some people call subprime, other people call fringe lenders. So just, just let me tell you that in the UK right now, there are 4.5 to 5 million people who borrow from somebody who comes to your door totally legally and legitimately to lend you loans of around £500 and they'll charge you 600%. There are 2.5 million people in the United Kingdom who regularly borrow from short-term lenders who will charge you anything from 3,500 to 4,500% for a short-term loan, totally legally and legitimately. Some of you may even have enjoyed their funding of the tube over the um, New Year period. Um, on top of that, there's about 2 million people who don't have a bank account and actually live in the cash economy. Um, and there's roughly about 200,000 people who do borrow money from someone, and in a way it doesn't really matter what they charge, because if you don't pay it back, they break your leg. So that's another side of the United Kingdom. And you've kind of got to wonder, why are people doing that? Like, what, what is going on? Why are they going there? This seems absolutely bonkers. We have banks, building societies, I mean, we have a few. We have fewer now than we did a little while ago, but they exist. People can access this kind of stuff, credit cards, bank accounts. These are all pretty standard things. Well, 
Let me tell you that there are three issues for a lot of people who are trying to access Ministry of Financial Services in the UK, and they kind of break into three areas. So the first is um, the first is around information. Um, we've we've seen an amazing revolution in our banking system over the last 25 years. I think when my dad uh, first came to, first came from Bangladesh to the UK, having a bank account wasn't standard. It was quite odd. And they estimate that maybe only 20 or 30 percent of the population actually had a bank account in the 70s. Um, and over the last 25 years, it's really it's been a massive revolution, really based on access to information, data. Um, this has allowed the unbanked to be reduced to very small amounts. Two million might sound a lot, but it's a lot less than 60 million. Um, and it's allowed the rest of us to enjoy free banking, cheap financial services in a way that just didn't exist before. But all of this is predicated on banks being able to find out, or credit institutions being able to find out who you are. They need to see your uh, passport. They need to be able to see um, whether you've got a utility bill. They need to see whether you've got a driving license. Uh, they need to see whether you've got any rent statements. They need to see lots and lots of things to make sure they know who you are. They need to know if you're in the electoral block. If you don't have that, it's actually difficult to break into the system. Um, once you get into the system, once you get in and you're recognised as being part of the credit system, actually they'll analyse you based on generally three things. Do you own a home? Um, do you have a job? Um, and have you borrowed before? So, if you score low on any of those, you're pretty unlikely to get access to finance at any rates that are affordable for most of us. So you can begin to immediately see who might have trouble accessing financial services in the UK. And it's not surprising that there would be people living in social housing, rented properties, people who um, haven't saved, um, maybe don't have a full-time job, have a part-time job or are self-employed, and also people who haven't borrowed from um, mainstream lenders before. So that kind of bonkers situation where you won't get credit if you already have access to it um, is true for lots of people, whether they're old or young. Um, the second issue is, so that, that affects quite a lot of people. The second issue is actually, even though some people have few choices, so they can't use the services that we would use at Barclays or HBOS or others, sometimes they choose not to use them because actually the products that they're offered are nowhere near or nowhere close to what they really want. So it's quite interesting to see that when you start talking to people about, well, what, why do you go to that doorstep lender? Why do you use that payday lender? What, what, what's really going on? You know, with a bit of help, you could, you know, you could work your way into the system. It's not so hard. You could get alternatives. You could talk to them. It's quite interesting what comes out. People say things like, well, you know what? Um, they're expensive, but get this. They're accessible. They're in my community. They're in communities where banks are generally closed. They come to my door. They're totally accessible. I know who they are. They're flexible. If I miss a payment today, I can pay tomorrow. I and mean, we'll come around my house, it's not a problem. Um, which might be a problem for some. Um, but it's flexible, right? Um, it's, if, if I'm paid every two weeks, I can, um, I can pay every two weeks. If I'm paid every six days, I can pay every six days. It's, it's not stuck to a structure that I have to worry about, somebody else's structure. Um, they also say it's simple. It's really simple and honest. Now those interest rates might sound bonkers, two and a half thousand, three thousand, crazy, right? Yeah. There's nothing simple about that. But I tell you what, when you borrow a loan from the doorstep lender, you don't care that the interest rate is 600%. What you really care about is that 500 pound loan costs you 20 pounds a week. When you go to the payday lender, you're not interested in three and a half thousand percent or four thousand percent. You're interested in 15 pounds per hundred every month. That's it. Um, and to people that's really straightforward and really simple. It's much, much simpler than suddenly finding out that you've got a penalty payment charge on your, because of a misdirect debit. Much more simpler and actually much more honest than hidden charges that you didn't actually think you knew anything about suddenly hitting you. Um, and on top of that, what comes out more and more, time and time again when you speak to people, is that they say, well, you know what, that person who comes around to the door, that, person, that institution that I go around to, they actually build a relationship with me. They know who I am, they know my name, and that counts for a lot. And they treat me with respect. They make no judgments about the fact that I don't have anything. They don't make any judgments about the fact that I want a small amount of money to do something very simple or very small. Um, they'll just do it. And these aren't people with baseball bats and rock wires. These are members of your community sometimes. They're your next door neighbour. I live next door to one for, for many years. They're just people who are on your estate. You know them. And so they treat you with respect and they build relationships. And in a way, what they've done is they've created a totally personalised, bespoke financial services for some people. On the other side, there's also a monopoly here. And the reason why I put the Competition Commission here is because even the government recognises that the mainstream institutions are not interested in moving down the income scale to all of these people. They're just not interested. 
And none of these people, none of these institutions care very much about losing any of these people. So they don't put their data onto the data files that the rest of the world or the rest of the country uses. So you can borrow 20 loans at a thousand percent, pay them off, and never be recognised for being a good repayer. You still have to borrow at a thousand percent because you're still not in the system. So, what well, the net result for poor people in the UK is that basically they get a bad service from the mainstream. Inappropriate products that don't fit their needs, nowhere near what they want. And the alternative is just very expensive. So they suffer. They suffer from a lack of imagination in our financial services, our bankers, <coughs> our financiers, our credit providers. Lack of imagination. Many of, them, many of these people are taking the same products that were designed over a hundred years ago, over a thousand years ago in some cases. There's no innovation here, there's nothing different. And with innovation could have come lower costs, cheaper products, more engaged systems, something that might actually be useful to them. But most of all, I think, what they really suffer is a, lack of, is a perception problem. A perception that if you're poor, there is no opportunity for anyone to come and do anything interesting down there. The perception that because if you're poor, products have to be this expensive. There's no other way of doing it. And that perception problem creates what I see as the biggest injustice in our financial services system. The inability of people to move out from being where they are to where they should be. And this has led to extortionate interest rates and exclusion. And this is true not just here in the UK, but this is absolutely true in Bangladesh and around the world. And in fact, every, every part of the world, I think it's the same reasons why people are financially excluded. Now, what's kind of interesting is there's actually another group in society who need exactly the same type of service and say the same kind of things about the financial products that they get. Flexible, accessible, uh, bespoke, personalised, um, uh, treated with respect, building a relationship. It's the very rich. Now, the only difference is the very rich can afford it and the very poor can't. And I think this is actually what's really quite interesting because what microfinance showed me and I think what it's doing very successfully in Asia and Africa, and what really kind of inspired me, was that what they've managed to do is reintroduce something that we've almost forgotten here in the United Kingdom. That sense of relationship banking, that high-touch service that's almost disappeared from our high streets, that way of connecting with people in an affordable way, bringing banking back down into streets and areas, communities and villages where it's just gone from. And I think that's the really fascinating thing, and that's what I'm spending my time doing, trying to create a private bank for the poor. A new form of banking that really says, let's start again. Let's start again and do something different. This is a bank that's going to be focused on the human touch, using the individual relationship that we have with each other to get over all those barriers to get people into the system. Using that smart computer that's inside our heads to start making those analyses as to whether you're a good repayer or a bad repayer. Not looking at your past and your history, but analyzing who you are to bring you into the system. And connecting with people so that when you do design products and when you do design services, they're based on need from what you know and find out rather than what you expect and what you assume about the poor. So I've already proved this already uh, in the UK. I've convinced investors and lenders to build a business that I've been running for the last five, six years. It's been really successful. We've convinced bankers that this model works, we've convinced, invest convinced investors that this model works, and I've done it really well for credit and advice. Um, and now we're moving and thinking about the same way of doing this in uh, a whole range of other services, from basic banking to savings to insurance and health, why not even pensions? Just about everything that you and I take for granted, rethinking all of it into these concepts of simplicity, flexibility, accessibility, re-engineering re, re our basic assumption about what is a risk and what is expensive. Um, now, why? Why am I doing this? Why am I even interested? Well, is it because that I saw an opportunity, because I'm cross-cultural and I've lived in East London? Maybe. Um, is, it, is it because the idea of you know, creating a business driven by social logic is quite innovative and quite exciting? Um, yeah, well, maybe. Um, or was it the sense of being able to turn our entire notion about creditworthiness on its head just a hell of a lot of fun? <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> um, but actually, um, actually, I think there's just a, there's a lot more. Um, there's a lot more. In a way, if we had the chance to start again, I'm not a financier. I, I've never studied. But I'm a geographer. That's my background. I'm, I know nothing about money really, but I do know quite a lot about people, and I do know that if we had the chance to recreate our financial system. 
I'm pretty sure it wouldn't look like this. Um, so I'm going to have a go. And that's really what I'm doing. I'm having a go at recreating piece by piece our financial system. But starting with a really poor and excluded person in the middle and saying, if I can make it work for them, maybe the rest of us might be interested in something different. Something that actually reconnected humanity back into our financial services. Something that gave us a sense of you know, finance is about who we are, who the person we're engaging and what we're doing with it. And maybe that might actually do something a bit more interesting. Maybe that might actually start making us demand for ch demand change and expectations around what the financial services industry is doing. Maybe we, we could revolutionise personal finance. Maybe we could make it something that is much more inclusive and more equitable for everybody. Because at the end of the day, that's just a much, much nicer world. And it's the kind of world where someone like Victoria can set up probably the finest plantain parlour in Dawson. <laughs> Thank you very much.